All right, here we are, day number four, Into the Word, Into the World. Let's give a call to hand. All right. <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> all right, here we are. Uh, we thank the Lord for all those who are online for joining us today. We are in lesson number four. And lesson number four is, is one that is uh, telling us about the covenant. And what is the covenant significant about the covenant? Right beside the number four there. The called people. Yeah, the called people. You might want to leave that table mic on so that, Okay. Good. All right. The called people. All right. And pick it up when you get ready to use it. All right. Uh, someone, if you would, then read the, uh, the scripture for us, please. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis, the 12th chapter, verses 2 and 3. Okay, very good, very good, very good. And uh, for those who have books there, would you read our human condition for us? We are be bewildered, overwhelmed. We search for a way to make sense out of life. We don't know what to do. We don't know how to begin. We yearn for a call that will take us beyond ourselves. All right, a call is what we're talking about here. And so we're going to get into, um, before we get into day one, what I'd have you do is, is there's a series of covenants that God is entering into with the people of God, the people of Israel, the Hebrew people. And so if you would then turn to Genesis chapter 9, verse 12. And this one is a universal covenant. Uh, and we'll find then that he starts off this covenant, and we'll let someone read so we can understand just the nature of a universal covenant in Genesis 9, chap chapter 9, verse 12. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. Okay, so you see the universality in it. For all generations to come, this covenant was more than just a covenant with Abram himself, or even just his immediate family, it was for all generations to come. And so we get a sense of the broadness of this generation. So that means that we can fall in under this covenant as well too. Especially through the blood of Jesus Christ, we are heirs, joint heirs with Jesus Christ of the promise, and this is the promise, this covenant that he was making with him. Okay, so now that's the universal covenant. Now there's three other ones too. The covenant uh, that is marked by the circumcision, if you go to Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Genesis 21, 1 through 4. And we'll find here where the mark of the covenant was explained. And so someone, when you find that, if you would read that for us, Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. And the Lord visited Sarah, and he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Okay, verse 4. That includes verse 4, right? Yes. Okay, so then we see the covenant now. Now the covenant is being sealed by what? What is the sign of the covenant again here? Circumcision. Okay, circumcision. All right, circumcision, you're right. Okay, so that was a sign for all the male childs, and we also see what day it's supposed to be done on, too. Okay, so someone tell us what day is it supposed to be done on? On eighth, eighth day. On oh. Amen. Okay, the eighth day. All right, the eighth day is when it's supposed to be on. Okay, now let's go to the, the next covenant then. And this is the covenant of the land. Okay, Genesis 15, if you would then. Genesis 15, 17 through 18. Genesis 15, 17 through 18, 17 and 18. Okay, we're going to get used to this mic thing. 
When the sun has set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire part with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euph Euphrates. 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 Okay. So while you have the mic then, what kind of covenant is this then? The this first is a cover of the land. Of the land. There you go. So you can see now that first is the promise of all generations, all generations. are going to be under this blessing of God. Then and we then have circumcision. The covenant of the circumcision. Right and now land. Good. And now the land. Very good. Very good. Now, if you can see it again over in chapter 17, verses 3 through 8, you'll also see it over there as well, too. When someone's ready, if you would read 17, 3 through 8. What chapter? Chapter 17, verses 3 through 8. Okay. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Okay. All right. So this is the covenant of what now then? The covenant of what? It's still the land. It's the land, it's yes. The covenant of land. Uh -huh. Right, because he said he's going to give him that yeah. land. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, also make note, too, Abram, was also, uh, the, the definition of Abram was exalted ancestor. Uh -huh. And so he changed his name from Abram, exalted ancestor, to Abraham, which is ancestor of a multitude. Uh -huh. And so now his name is depicting that it's not just an ancestor. He's going to be the ancestor of a multitude of people. And so now we see this covenant goes on for generations and generations. And so that's the blessing that we're operating under. Okay, so now we have a universal covenant. We've had a covenant of circumcision. We have a covenant of land. Now let's go to the next one then. That's Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19, verses 4 and 5. Exodus chapter 19, verses 4 and 5. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasure possession, although the whole earth is mine. Okay. Verses 4 All and 5. Right. Okay, there you go. Now, this is a covenant of the Torah. This is a covenant of the Torah because what you find happening here in chapter 19, after 19, we get into chapter 20. Uh, does anyone's Bible identify what chapter 20 is? Does your Bible identify what chapter 20 is? Mine said the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. All right, now. So the Ten Commandments are also now their code of conduct. It means um, their morality code. It means their ethical code. It means the foundation of how they are to live. And so now this covenant now has expanded and gotten into more detail on here's how you're to live. Here's how you're to treat each other. Here's how you're to relate to me. You know, you had no other gods before me. Uh, you shall not uh, covet your neighbor's uh, possessions. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You know, it's not come out adultery. All these are relational issues. And so now we have this broad general covenant of universality. Then we have a covenant of the land, a part of our agreements. I'm going to give you this land as a people. 
And then, then we have a covenant now of the circumcision, which is here's a sign that you're in covenant with me as a people. And then lastly, but not leastly, the covenant of the Torah, meaning here's how you are to live and here's how you're to relate to each other. So then what we have now, a covenant. Can anyone tell me what, a, what you think a covenant is? What is a covenant? Your own definition. That's a binding uh, agreement between God and God's people. Yes, that's right. It's a binding agreement, agreement between God and God's people, and it's always initiated by God. A covenant with God is always initiated by God. We don't initiate a covenant with God. He initiates the covenant. And with Jesus Christ, the new covenant, he initiated that. You know, we didn't ask for Jesus. He sent us Jesus. And so therefore, that's how the covenant works when it comes to God. Now, we can cover together each other, but we're talking about the covenant that's done with God, a divine covenant between God and people, and in this case, us as people. Okay, so I want you to see that. I want you to see how this covenant has different um, areas of it, different um, uh, dimensions to it. And it is an awesome covenant that God enters into. Okay, so now we understand covenant. We understand the different types of covenant. Let's go into our readings uh, for today. And what we're going to do, class, is that uh, you'll only be accountable for day one and day two. And for our online class, day one and day two is what we'll talk about because our limited time, uh, we can't go through all five days that you have of readings. So we're going to zero in on uh, day one, uh, which day one is chapter 12 and 13. Also chapter 14 as well. Uh, 14 verse 17 through 17 verse 21 or day one. So let's get into that now then. Okay, here we have the call of Abraham or Abram and Sarai and the covenant with God. Uh, is there anything that you find interesting in your reading in day one of your reading? Well, for me, it was the fact that God called Abram to leave everything that he knew mm -hmm. and to, to follow him. Mm -hmm. And if he was obedient, mm -hmm. he would be the father of many nations. Yes, yes. I got to ask you all to, just to think for a second. You know, would you go wherever God called you to go? I mean, just pack up, take what you got. And now, the, remember, the, the covenant with Abram was, he didn't tell him exactly where to go. He told him to go south. So he didn't even give him full instructions on here's exactly where you're going to end up. Here's what it's going to be like when you get there. He just tells him to leave your father. Let's read that part then. Um, where did you find that? Genesis, Genesis 12, was it? Uh -huh, Genesis 12. Okay, um, when you find that. Where that it's, is? Um, chapter 12, verses starting at uh, verse 1. Okay. Okay, let's read down through that part of that and see how that conversation goes. Um, now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And the first three or four words of verse four says what? So Abram departed. Yes. Now was there anything specific on where he was going? No. no. Well, I'm trying to find it now. There's a scripture that says, Abram, There's a scripture that says Abraham was looking for a place whose builder and maker was God or whose foundations was God. It's in, I think it's in Romans somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it says Abraham, uh, Abraham was looking for a place who, he's talking about him stepping out on faith mm -hmm. and that uh, he was looking for a place whose, whose builder and maker was God. Okay. Or some, and, some and translation says very, whose that's foundations. Very that's very true. He was looking for that place. You know, but what we find here, and my point was here, you know, that place wasn't definitive. No, God just there, said, there, there was, there was God not, told him to go to a land. He said that I will show you. Yes. He tells him to go to a land that I will show you, 
which means he didn't give them where this land was going to be. And before we have a definition of where it was going to be, we have the response in verse 4, so Abraham went. And so then now my question to you all again then is, if, if God says, okay, Sister Stokes, I, I am God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, the, the Heavenly Father of Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, and I am speaking to you, I need you to go to a place I will show you. So my question to, to Sister Stokes, but anyone can answer the question, I, what, what, what would be your response? I would try to obey, but I, I don't know if I would pick up at 75 years of age like <laughs> Abram was. And, uh, you know, but we should obey because yeah. we try to let this be the authority, the word of what yeah. God wants us to do. And if we obey, he takes care of us. But that one is a little bit more difficult, Pastor. <laughs> Here, Gregory. <laughs> <laughs> Well, for me, I, I have to say, if, uh, if I had read this when I was younger mm -hmm. and when my response was even different, it would be no. <laughs> but as I have gotten older and have um, been obedient, as we have been obedient to God to move from place to place and um, going places where you have no family and no one that you know, um, I have to say that uh, it does make you depend on God um, mm -hmm. because um, you don't know anyone and so you're there and you have nobody but God. Mm -hmm. So to answer that question today, it would be yes, mm -hmm. I could do that. Mm -hmm. But 30 years ago, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it is something, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very daunting thing, and, and we certainly don't want to minimize it, you know, because to have yourself in complete trust of God, I mean complete trust of God, to your provision, uh, your housing, uh, your future, you know, all that is complete trusting what you have heard from the Lord. Mm -hmm. And understand, by leaving his, his kindred in his father's land, he has left his inheritance behind. Mm -hmm. He has left everything that would have been owed to him as his father's son and all the security that provided. And so then it's a very, and that's why Abraham is heralded, mm -hmm. you know, as one of a man of faith. The father of faith. The father of faith, yeah. And when they go down the roll call of those who have been faithful in the New Testament, Abraham's the first one they talk about. Mm -hmm. You know, so we, we see the, the, the awesome, awesomeness of following God. I know the scripture says that uh, because Abraham believed God, he was called the friend of God. Yeah. And that word friend, it carries the thought, birds of a feather flock together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and, uh, and he, he yeah. walked that close with God and trusted God. And if God said it, he believed it. Yeah. You know. So it was that kind of relationship. Yeah, yeah we was talking mm -hmm. about it earlier, about the young lady. Mm-hmm. The missionary. Yeah. And I think that sometimes, even though I spoke, I spoke up on it too, but I think that sometimes, even though we know in the scripture said they were sent out by two, mm -hmm. you know, and, but there, there is, uh, 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 special circumstances where, uh, uh, um, well, let me put it this way. Even though we, we, we know God as what he's done, mm -hmm. but I think that we got to be careful not to put him in the box. Mm -hmm. Because just like the scripture we read, he said, I'm God, everything's mine, mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. And so as we, even as we, as we look and see what he's done, to know that he's God and he can still do anything. And I think that that's pretty much how the children of Israel missed, him, missed Jesus when he came. Because they expected him to come one way, reigning, mm -hmm. and instead he came hum humbly and took on the form of a sinful, that's a very good point because sinful man. man. We, but we, they knew because him because uh, God is sovereign yeah. and therefore because he is sovereign then he can do a new thing mm -hmm. and, and we're not to question him now we are to question the motives of those who say oh. they're doing this in the name of God you know and so then you test the, uh, you know, the spirit with the spirit 
but uh, uh, we cannot put limit uh, boxes on God on what he's doing. Okay, so that, that, that's something. And what I put in my notes, and the fact he was 75 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't start his ministry until 75 years old. And every once in a while in a church, I'll hear someone say, well, you know, this person's older, you know, they're, they're in their 70s, you know, and you can't expect them to. But see, that's the difference when you've read the scripture. Yeah. And you know that he didn't start until he was 75. Uh, Moses didn't start his, his mission work or his ministry work until he was 80. Mm -hmm. And so then how are we to say, well, oh, no, you know, that, that's just too much to ask someone to do something that God's led them to do because they're 75 or they're 80 years old. You know, if God so chooses to use them and they feel the Lord is leading them, you let them go. Because you know, if they're doing God's will, God has them. You know, he has them under their protection. So then we're not to interfere mm -hmm. with someone who feels a calling of God regardless of the age, young or old. Mm -hmm. Because we have the other example with Timothy being a young man. He said, do not let them despise your youth. So we, we, we let God be God and let God choose whom God wants to, when God chooses to decide to choose them. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's continue on then. Uh, let's see. So the blessing I, I have in here is verse 7. It says, And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring... I will give you this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And so the blessing then did not go to Abram, did it? No. It went to his ancestors. And so now Abram does something that he's not going to get a blessing from. Now for them in that day and time to bless my ancestors was truly a blessing. If I do something for my ancestors, that's a rich blessing for me. I have set them in a position. But in our modern context, we tend to want the blessing to come to us. We're expecting it for us. But this shows us, no, it wasn't even about Abraham. He was being obedient so that his offspring would be blessed by God. And so that, that speaks a lot. We had a generation within our own culture who sacrificed you know, went with just simple clothing to make sure their children had clothing. You know, worked several jobs to make sure their children had what they needed, you know. Uh, uh, all these kind of things we did for our children, you know. Uh, but now we're entering into a generation where everybody wants to live their own life. And we'll hear sometimes young parents say, well, I, I'm young. I need to live my own life, mm -hmm. you know, even though they have a child. So anyway, so we, we find very interesting, very interesting. We learn a lot as we go through here. Anything else you find there in day one that got your attention, chap captured your attention? I noticed that after the Lord appeared to him that he built the altar yes. and began to worship the Lord. Yes. And I, I, I guess I know we don't build altars today, but... I, I would imagine uh, when God give us a revelation, when he, you know, whatever way he wants to speak to us, mm -hmm. uh, that there uh, we would uh, offer up some type of thanksgiving mm -hmm. or worship. Worship, there you uh -huh. go. And so that, that's true then. When there's an interaction with God and a sincere interaction with God, we find several times the natural tendency is to worship. You know, not that God had done it right then, just the fact that we had a communication, we had an experience with God, a natural reaction is to worship. And that's just exactly what it did. Very, very astute. Very astute, yes. Uh, I, I also had here in, um, let's see, chapter, um, let's see. Yeah, chapter 13, verse 14. Take a look at that if you would. Read 14 through 18, if someone would, please. 14 through 18. Chapter 14, verse 14 chapter through 13, 18. Chapter 13. 13, verse, verse 14 through 18. Yes, that's it. Thank you. The, the Lord said to Abram, after the lot had parted from him, lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south east and west. All the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. Mm -hmm. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and breadth of the land 
for I am giving it to you. So Abram moved his tent and went to live near the great trees of Mar at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. Okay, very good. Now what I want to point out here was that he didn't find out where the land was until after he had been obedient. And so we saw earlier where he made a promise to him, you go and I will, you just go. And he went. But he didn't see the place until later on after he had been obedient. And so therefore, what it, what it, what it shows us what it shows us then is that what it shows us then is that it's after the obedience many times when the blessing comes. And so what we want to do is uh, step out on faith and be obedient. And then sometimes after the obedience is when we will make when we may actually see the actual coming of our obedience. And so as we know, scripture says God prefers obedience even unto sacrifice. And so then therefore, here's the evidence. Obedience first, he gets up, he leaves, and then now he actually shows him the land that he's going to get. So that was something else I wanted to show you there. Pastor. Yes. Uh -huh. um, the, uh, another thing that uh, came to my mind is how God changed their names, both uh, Abram and Sarai. Mm -hmm. um, and was that to signify um, that they were new, they were different people yes. Yes. In, in this walk? Yes. Of obedience? Yes, it is. And that's what we were talking about earlier from Abram, meaning, you know, ancestor, you know, uh, exalted ancestor to ancestor of, you know, generations, effectively, of, of multitudes. Yeah, he expanded. The name of the person spoke to much of what their life was going to be. And so then when he changed the name, it changed what the anticipation of what their life was going to be. So a very powerful thing. And so I know... Uh, We've come to this generation where we are today. Uh, we don't have the tendency to have the importance of the name, you know. But for generations, the name was very important and it meant something, you know. And so, especially in ancient times, it meant a great deal of what that person expected in their life. They would name their child, you know. Um, was it um, Ruth, uh, Naomi, changed the name from Naomi to Mara because she was depressed, so she just changed her name to depict how she felt. Right. You know, and so, yeah, name meant a lot. And names do mean a lot. Okay. Uh, something else I wanted to bring your attention to. Chapter 14, verse 20. Okay, we're in Genesis, chapter 14. And for the students who have just come in to catch you up, what we were talking about is the covenant relationship between Abraham uh, and God. And God initiates this covenant with him. He initiates the covenant with all of us. But he also initiated a covenant with Abraham. And he called Abraham to leave and didn't even tell Abraham where he was going. But Abraham, out of obedience, heard from God, did what God called him to do, and then he received the blessing. And the blessing was not for Abraham. The blessing was for the next generation. Mm -hmm. And so Abraham wasn't even promised that he would receive the blessing. But he did it because it was going to bless the next generation. So a very powerful story of Abraham and his faith. That also, that also showed... Um, um, the love that Abraham had for the next generation yes. Yes. to be willing, you know, that was quite a sacrifice. Yeah, to leave everything behind to go. Sister uh, Stokes, you were going to say something? Oh yeah, but uh, I think you were getting ready to go there when you said uh, chapter 14 verse 20. I was just saying verse 21 was the first time Yes, that, and that's what I was going to, yes. Yeah, so, so I, didn't want, I didn't want to get ahead of you, but okay. that was one of the things I was going to mention mm -hmm. when it said, and blessed be God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abra gave him a tenth of everything. Okay, let's back up and read 17 through 20 because this is significant. Some people, uh, opponents of the tithe say we're not under the law anymore. Okay, so therefore, since we're not under the law, uh, the tithing is a part of the law. We're under grace now. So therefore, tithing is inappropriate or is non, you know, does not relate to the New Testament times. So if someone reads seven, chapter 14 of Genesis, 17 through 20. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer. 
and the kings who were with him. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Why should we pick and up? Okay. All right. So what we're saying here is to give God a tenth is, you know, pre-law and it's post-law. Because we have Jesus who also then uh, honors that. And in fact, I think we can find that in Matthew, if you would. Go to Matthew. And we're going to find where Jesus makes the one reference to the tithe. And that's when he is derating the, um, the, the Pharisees. And he's speaking of them and how they are... Okay, if you find it, then speak where you found it. Okay, chapter 23 is where you'll find it. Go to Matthew chapter 23. And chapter 20, Matthew chapter 23, verse 19. And this is the one time that Jesus... Now, this is New Testament. And so someone... We're going to hear that from a different couple of versions. Someone read verse 19 of chapter 23 of Matthew. No, okay, go down to verse 23, I'm sorry. 23. Chapter 23, verse 23 is what I need you to read. 23. I'll read it in the, uh, in yeah. the uh, okay. there you go. message. All right. 23 and what? 24 or just 23? 23. Chapter 23, verse 23. You're hopeless, you religion scholars and Pharisees, frauds. You keep meticulous account, bo account books, tithing on every nickel and dime you get, but on the meat of God's law, things like fairness and compassion and commitment, the absolute basics, you carelessly take it or leave it. Careful bookkeeping is commendable, but the basics are required. Yeah, but it doesn't say anything. Well, but he, okay, let's basics. get it from another translation yeah. then. I know. Okay, another translation. This is the New King James Version. Uh, woe, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Okay. So then what we have then is saying that you're to do, and what you should have done, you should have attend to the justice, mercy, and faith issues, but not neglect the tithe. Okay? And so that's, that's what we're finding here. So now we have both Old Testament before the law, where they tithe, and we have New Testament under the New Covenant, where Jesus says you should attend to the weightier matters you know, of faith, justice, and mercy, but don't neglect the others, which is the tithing of, of what God has given you. So there, there really is no sound scriptural uh, defense for not doing it, for not giving the tithe. Okay, okay so that, that's a good point. That's the first origination of where we find the very first time the tithe coming into existence. Okay, anything else you, you yeah. find here? Yes, uh, please. If you, you, when you were in, uh, we were, you were in Fort... 13. Okay. Genesis 14. Okay. Uh, Genesis 13. Well, no, Genesis 12. I'm sorry. Okay. Genesis 12. We were talking about, um, yes, I mean, uh, 13. I'm sorry. Okay. 13 and, uh, when, uh, when, when, when 14? God blessed Abraham and told Abraham to look up. Yeah, verse 14. Verse 14? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay, but I was looking for the verse that it says that after Lot left, 
after Lot had chose his land, mm -hmm. he looked up and saw that everything was well watered and everything was good. And Abraham told him to pick which way he wanted to go. Once he left, once he picked, then God appeared to Abraham. Mm. And and I don't know. I I I, I, get, I, I sometimes I I look at it as if if like God called Abraham originally, but Abraham took Lot. Mm. And sometimes God can call us and tell us to do something, and sometimes we can carry some extra baggage along mm. that God didn't tell us to. <laughs> and sometimes it can hold. You know, it, it might hold up our blessing or hold up a, a, the rest of the revelation that God wants to give to us. And it's not until. We get rid of that because we even look at Lot's heart. When Abraham said, you look to the south or look to the north, whichever you go, whichever way you want to go, he cho even though he was going along for the ride, he chose the best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, you, you can see, you can look at the heart and see how grateful Lot was, you know, when it comes to. Yeah, because when you, when you look back at the original charge to Abraham, or uh, Abram at that time, he didn't say to take Lot. And nowhere did he say to take Lot. But there was also um, a duty that he had because Lot being his nephew and evidently Lot's father not being alive, then he was responsible for him. But Lot was grown, wasn't he? Yeah, but, you know, we don't know how grown Lot was. And so then evidently there was a sense I still have an obligation to take and care, take care of Lot. And so he brought with him. But your point is very valid, though. You know, sometimes those who we take with us may not have the same heart for God that we have acquired. And, and that could be a struggle. And that's the old issue about unequally yoked, where one has a heart for God and the other one doesn't. Then you're unequally yoked and it's difficult to move in a good, clear direction because one's lagging behind in a desire to know God and to follow God. And so that, it's good to be equally yoked. Okay, anything in chapter day two that you found here uh, interesting? Where? Chapter, day two is chapter 18 through 22 of Genesis. It was interesting when they had the three visitors and yes. then Abraham immediately noticed them and welcomed them and went out to get the best to prepare for them. Mm -hmm. But Sarah was in the house listening and that's when they let them know that they were going to have a child. And she laughed. She didn't believe this, you know. So that was, uh, they said they would come back a year later and this would occur. But, you know, at that age, they was past the childbearing age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he was, let's see, was, was, she was 90? I think she was 90. Yeah, she was 90. Yeah, she was 90. Yeah, yeah, so we... We, we think it's something when a woman can conceive in, in her late 30s and 40s. <laughs> I guess there's one who was conceived in, at 60, but uh, here she is 90 and she's conceiving. So, so quite, quite, uh, a, quite, quite an ordeal here. Okay, so yeah, so they, they tell her she doesn't respond. And, and we have the, the counter to that. Now let's go to Matthew again. And we're going to have another woman who is being uh, told about a birth. And this is Mary, so go to Matthew, Will, if you would please. And the very first parts of Matthew, find your way there, where she is um, being told about the birth of her child. Uh, is that uh, chapter 1? Chapter 1, uh -huh. yeah, verse 18 uh -huh. and following. So if someone would read chapter 1, verses 18 down through verse 25. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, 
and you are to give him the name Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. Okay, now let's go over to Luke chapter chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 39. And here's where we have the dialogue with Mary. Okay, it starts actually in verse, um, okay, verse 26 and following. So someone read verse 26 and following. So 26 to 39? Uh, 26, let's say through 35. Okay. Reading from the New International Version. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel in Nazareth, a town into Galilee, to a virgin ple pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at, the, at his voice with his wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will... Re, re, reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy, Holy One to be born, who will be called the Son of God. And then verse 38. Continue on from... Read verse 38 as well, oh, too. Okay. Mm -hmm. I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, It will be to me according to the word. Then the angel left her. Okay. And my response, and Mary's response in verse 38 was, Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. And so here we have two different accounts uh, women who are being told that they're going to conceive. You know, Sarai in disbelief and laughter, you know, and understandably so, what, what the age that she was. And then here's Mary, you know, who gets felt humbled by the fact of who she was going to give birth to. And then as a result of that, then she says, here am I. And her response is, okay, then, then I'll be it. Okay, so we find those two responses there. Okay, anything else you find in, in day one or day two? Oh, um. yeah, when Abraham took Isaac up to uh, offer him as a burnt offering. Okay, and where are we? Oh, um, back in Genesis. Yeah, chapter 22. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we'll start in verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. 
So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, my father. And he said, here I am my son. Then he said, look the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Yes. Very powerful, isn't it? Very, very powerful. And again, that's why Abraham is just hel heralded as the father of faith. <laughs> It's one thing to leave and go to a land you're not sure you're going to. It's a whole other thing to wait all these years to receive a child, and especially a man child or a boy child, which is so critical in that day and time. And then God tells you to do something that's just outside of what you think God would ever call you to do. But then out of obedience, you do it. And so we're going to summarize our, our lesson today is about covenant and how God enters in covenant with us, you know, and we are part of the new covenant under Jesus Christ. And all that God promised Abram or Abraham, I will be your God, you will be my people, I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who curse you, and, you know, and with you I will be with you always. It says we are heir to the promise because we have a faith in Christ. And that's the promise that we are heirs to. So we, will rec we receive that promise that God will be our God and we will be his people and he will bless those who bless us and curse those who curse us, you know, because we receive that as heirship because we believe in Christ Jesus. Okay. All right, then. Thank you very much. Or is there any one last question that we have there then? Anyone of anybody of any mind then? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. I'd like to make a comment. A comment if it's, if it's okay. Well, you're speaking about the covenant, right? And, and, I know that when we personally receive our covenant that we have with, Jesus, uh, with God through Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. as we see Abraham with Lot, and Abraham was constantly standing in the gap for Lot when the angels was going to destroy Sodom and when they had to battle all the kings, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I, I think it was because Abraham was assured of that covenant that he had with God that it caused him it, 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 it caused him to, to want to reach out to somebody else, to want to uh, 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 be a blessing to somebody else because when he received that covenant, he was blessed already, even though he hadn't received the material part of it, the land, you know, and all that. And I think as we truly understand our covenant that we have with God. I was talk, telling a young lady the other day about how no one she always smiling and the joy of the Lord is all over her, you know what I'm saying? And when we understand who we are mm -hmm. through Jesus Christ, we want to reach out to people. We want to treat people right. We want to love people. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, and I just wanted to say that, that when we understand that covenant, it makes a difference. And a very astute uh, comment you made there because uh, another way of saying it too is when we receive the Spirit of the Lord. Exactly. When we receive the Spirit of the Lord, it, it, our love then extends beyond us. Our concern extends beyond us. You know, we just naturally are empathetic and concerned and genuinely concerned about others. And that's the evidence that God's Spirit dwells within us because God was not concerned just about one. He was concerned about all. And he so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son. So that, that we find. Very good point. Okay, we're going to conclude today. Let's finish out our class and everybody just enjoy the Lord as he, he called us to do. All right. <laughs> Okay, before we do that, one, one, one last thing before we do that, your assignment for next class is, is here. So those who are watching online, you can pick this up, and I'll leave this for the class. But goodbye, everybody online, and the class here can write this down as we sign off. Goodbye. <laughs>